coming to you from fabulous Las Vegas. The right side is the winning side. The late move is the correct move. Sports betting capital of the world. We all know when a sharp like me weighs in, the lines move. It's a party for your ears. <laughs> This is The Buffet with Chad and Scooch. I want to buy that guy a buffet. Welcome to The Buffet with Chad and Scooch. I am Chad Millman, part of the Action Network. On the phone with me from Las Vegas, representing the Orleans and all the Boyd Gaming books in the state of Nevada, Bob Scucci, premier bookmaker. What's happening? Hey, Chad, buddy? how you doing? Not much. I'm great. Dude, we have a huge show. I mean, we have a Super Bowl coming up, which is a massive deal. And so obviously... We're going to talk about that at length from every way that we possibly can, and then we can do it again next week uh, once we get closer to the game. But we'll um, – I think we should do a preliminary scooch roulette pick on a prop at the end of this show, and then we will do a game pick at the end of the next show. <clears throat> okay. I expected a little more enthusiasm. <laughs> Well, a lot of the pro a lot of the props aren't going to be up until uh, until the end of the week. So, are you talking about props that are up elsewhere, or uh, props that you've already seen? I don't know, Scooch. We'll we'll figure it out when we get there. That's how we do this show. We fly by the seat. We of our wing business. it. Like, okay. I haven't even told people what's happening on the show yet. Like after you and I do our little banter and we answer some questions from um, from listeners and tweeters. Uh, there's going to be a, an interview with Jeff Schwartz, former NFL lineman, current host on NFL Serious Radio. Uh, he is going to be one of the analysts with me on our live stream Super Bowl Sunday show that you can follow along from at Action Network HQ. Um, we're going to be producing a really fun show. We're calling it Pick a Palooza. It's the best of the pregame shows without any of the stuff you don't like. Wow, that sounds awesome. It's going to be great, right? Yeah. So like basically it's only about betting. It's a pregame show that is entirely about betting. Right. That's right. it. Uh, so Jeff is going to be on the, on the podcast and he's going to be on the show with me. Um, we have to get to some user questions, but I first have to mention this, a reminder, the get your prop up in Vegas contest has begun. I tweeted it out. Send your entries to props contest P-R-O-P-S-C-O-N-T-E-S-T at actionnetwork.com. That's two N's in the middle, actionnetwork.com. You got to send them in by Monday morning, this Monday morning, Monday, January 29th. Send them in by like 9 a.m. Eastern. I'm going to plow through them. I'm going to send them to Scooch, and it's going to be a blast. And someone's going to win. Someone's going to get their prop up in Vegas. We're going to take a picture. We'll probably have them on the podcast. Um, it's going to be awesome. So what do you think of that, Scooch? <clears throat> I, I can't wait. I mean, we do it every year. It's a lot of fun sifting through all these props. And uh, we've been doing it for, I mean, quite a few years. And I've, we've gotten some really original props up there. So, I mean, do you want to lay out some of the things that we can't put up on the board? Uh, you know, th this is Las Vegas, and so we're governed by the, the Gaming Control Board. So there's the, the, the kind of props that you could, the fun kind of props that you see, like maybe, uh, you know, the length of the national anthem or uh, the um, how many times a camera is going to go to a particular person in the seats. Uh, we can't book those kind of props because we, we need an official source Uh, for for the results and and some of that stuff there is no official source so it has to be decided on the field of play uh, and we we have to be able to go to kind of nfl.com and and look at the official statistics to get the results of whatever prop we're going to put up so that's just a little caveat you guys are like the no fun league of bookmaking we are unfortunately i know we gotta gotta go by all these rules you don't sound too good scoot you sound like you're sick or something Oh, I've been sick all weekend, but I'm going to muddle through again. I know I just got over something two weeks ago, and then I got some kind of fever and some kind of chest congestion. It's just nasty out here. Oh, my God. I'm so sick of you. <laughs> It's all these tourists bringing in their germs. 
Wow, now you're just deriding the customers. All the people <laughs> who come to you begging for like autographs and they want to see scoops and they love the buffet. You're like, you're making me sick, literally. Right? <laughs> I know. It's terrible. All right. Here's a question. Are you ready? Yeah. From Jake, Jake Riepma, uh, at Jake underscore Riepma. The odds the Eagles fans destroy the city of Minneapolis if Philadelphia wins. Over, under of Eagles fans arrested. Give me odds on Eagles fans destroying Minneapolis. I think they could do it. I think they could tear I, that mother effing city down. Yeah, if they if they win it, they're they're a two dollar favorite to tear something down. So number of arrests, I don't know, thirteen and a half. Thirteen and a half seems low, my friend. I would take the over on that. Easily. Would you really? Oh wow! Yeah. If they win, have, yeah. Are you kidding me? If they win, that's a no brainer. <laughs> Okay. All right, we'll I'll bet see. all the money I would have won on the Jags and the Saints in the Super Bowl on over 13 and a half. That's There's right. No doubt about we, it. We locked up that hundred bucks. <laughs> what are you going to do with it? Do you, have, do, you have my, do you have my $100 just earmarked for something special in like the the Boyd budget? Yeah. You know what? I, I, I think we do. That's <clears throat> it's a number of it, it's let's, let's see. It's a uh, four. Four buffets, four dinner buffets. So there you go. Wow, the, the value of a dinner buffet that you give away is twenty five dollars. The seafood dinner buffet is like first rate. The seafood with the crab legs and the uh, the oysters and the yeah, it's the the peel and eat shrimps. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> peel and eat shrimps. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's singular. I don't think it's, it's oh, like peel and eat, yeah, peel, peel and eat shrimp. Yes. Yeah. I don't yeah. mean to turn the buffet one, into a grammar lesson, but it's one big pile of shrimp. Yeah. But I think shrimp and shrimp is it's all singular. I don't think you shrimps, like yeah. pluralize the shrimps. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know where that S came from. Unless it's a room full of guys like you and me. <laughs> then we're a bunch of shrimps. Bunch of shrimps. Uh, all yes. right. Do you? Uh, this is from Snokes Twenty One. Do you anticipate the Patriots move closer to minus seven in the week leading up to the Super Bowl? Uh, are the Sharps waiting for that to grab plus six or better? No, I, I see it going the other way. As a matter of fact, why? Well, I mean, we could we could kind of look at the the where the money's going now and the number of tickets. And um, I think if they were going to grab the Patriots. Uh, and we could talk about this a little bit later. Uh, they would have done it when some places hung minus five, and some places hung minus six and a half. And there was a there was a chance for a little bit of an arbitrage, and they didn't do it. So um, if they didn't do it then, I, I don't anticipating them doing it until this line gets down to maybe four and a half. And you think it's going to go to four and a half? That's what you're seeing. <clears throat> I, I would. Well, I would say there's more likelihood of that than going back up to seven. Mm-hmm. Matt Devine, we're going to get into that. Matt Devine at SI, SI Guru Twenty One. At this stage, how many points less, if any, is Foles worth compared to the value of Wentz at the time he was injured? Well, you know that's the whole question here, and that's the reason why the Eagles were underdogs in both their their playoff games, and they they overcame the odds. So that gap has been shortening. You know, so. The first game that Foles played in the regular season after Wentz went out, we would have said, you know, the the, the difference is about six points. And st- since then, it's been shortening up to where I'm not sure there's much more of a, than a, than a three point difference right now. So if Wentz started this game, I mean, we're not going to say that if Wentz uh, starts that this game's going to go down to a pick 'em. Uh, so I, I mean, I think we've already kind of shortened that gap of what Wentz is worth to to what. Uh, uh, Foles is worth. So like Carson Wentz, you're saying Carson Wentz was worth about six against yeah. the point spread, and Nick yeah. Foles is now worth about six points against the point spread, is what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, they're about, they're about the same now. I mean, uh, <clears throat> obviously, if Wentz started started this game and he was healthy, the line would be probably about Patriots two and a half. So, I mean, there still would be that perception. But But what I'm saying is, we made this line, the Patriots, minus seven prior to both uh, championship games on Sunday. So we thought the Patriots-Eagles matchup, the Patriots would be seven. But because the Eagles looked so good, the Patriots didn't look as dominating as, as people expected. That line came down. But, you know, that seven was 
uh, that initial seven was based on getting a Nick Foles instead of Carson Wentz. And now I'm saying that even if, we, you know, that the, the, it's not as big of a drop off. That's all I'm saying. Man, that's fantastic. Good for yeah. Nick Foles. I, we, yeah. we had a story. We had a story in the Action Network over the weekend. Um, I think it came out on maybe on Monday um, by Matthew Friedman. Maybe it came out yesterday. Uh, talking about how Nick Foles is actually from the from a Vegas plus minus perspective, which is sort of when Friedman, who's a pretty smart guy, uh, takes what the um, implied value of a team's total points are uh, versus the implied value of their opponent and creates a metric that says they're plus or minus sort of the implied value. And the implied value is really based on um, the point totals, you know, in every game, sort of the average of the point totals. So the Eagles all season long had been plus near four and a half points against the implied total. So if you had the Eagles averaging, you know, in your implied totals every week, they were supposed to score about 26 points a game. They were at about 30 points a game, right? Wow. Um, wow. I, I'm making up the numbers because like, I don't have my head. I'm just sort of – let's say it was 15 and they were at 19. But they led the league in sort of implied um, plus Vegas plus minus. With Nick Foles, there has been zero drop-off. Um, Nick Foles had like a really bad game, I think, against the Raiders and then a, you know, a game where he barely played against the Cowboys. Other than that, he's had phenomenal games. And so yeah. there is this perception, like we wrote about this in the newsletter, actionnetwork.com. You can sign up for the newsletter. Um, there is this perception, and that's that's what everything is based on about Nick Foles. And we've all been making bad decisions about the Eagles because it's been Nick Foles instead of Carson Wentz. And it's really been interesting to me because of that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there was one game, the 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 Falcons game that uh, was kind of a, a an ugly game to watch, but I, but but I think outside of that one, uh, <clears throat> Foles has been effective, and you know he he fits in this offense, and you can you could kind of say certain offenses just work with without a a premier quarterback and some offenses uh that are built around a, a, a guy like drew Brees, or uh that that there would be a much much bigger uh drop off with a with an inferior quarterback but other other off i mean you look at almost every game and and Foles has been really really effective and uh he hasn't made any of the big mistakes i, th- I think there was just that one game where there was a turnover but they overcame it uh, i think he early in the game and i forgot which game it was maybe the falcons where he turned it over dropped it and they ran in for a touchdown but um he, he's been he's been really effective and that's the whole reason why they've been such big underdogs and i think i'm, I'm just worried about getting into that trap again in this game you know they they were Underdogs in both playoff games, they they overcame them. They were clearly the better team in both in both games, and uh, there I mean there was no real luck involved, and uh, and now it seems like a lot of points to be uh, to going into this game. Now, on the other side of the coin, how much can we take into account the Patriots game on Sunday? And you know, without Gronkowski and with with Brady with a cut on his hand and maybe you know he didn't practice all week so i mean there's other contingencies as well uh but that's the whole basis of this line movement going from you know 7 was what the theoretical line would have been prior to those championship games and now down to 5 and a half and the public is just really jumping on this Eagles team uh you know they've been cashing tickets betting on the Eagles so they you know they're not they're not stopping and uh, I think with the with the exception of the Patriots beating the Titans, I think every underdog is covered so far in the uh, in the playoffs. So why not take another uh, hot team getting getting five and a half points? Well, it's so interesting, right? Like Nick Foles is a lightning rod. There couldn't be a more bland quarterback who is such a lightning rod come the Super Bowl. But he's like. What do you do with this guy? Is he the guy who was a superstar with the Eagles for that one year? Is he the guy who could barely sort of beat anybody out in Kansas City or St. Louis for the next couple of years? Is he the guy who is throwing bombs into the corner of the end zone with pinpoint accuracy? Um, Certainly, it's interesting that the public has come all in on the Eagles because it's a matchup of, you know, historically public versus recently public. 
and it plays to the whole concept of recency bias that you and I always talk about. Like yeah. they are they are playing on this Eagles team because of what they saw against the Vikings, and they, all of a sudden exactly. they are believing in Nick Foles. Exactly, and you know those same people that watch the Patriots game, they feel like the Patriots got a little fortunate to win that game. They feel like, you know, uh, that there was a little desperation down there in the fourth quarter and Brady's slinging it up there and looking for the, those pass interference calls and he got them. And, uh, and they barely pull that one out down 10 points in the fourth quarter. That's not the kind of Patriots team that the betters were accustomed to betting on for many years and had that confidence to kind of lay uh, almost a touchdown in, in the Super Bowl on. So, there really is that recency bias, and and you know the Eagles wrapped up their game by halftime. I mean that was a, a dominant performance, and I think as a handicapper you have to say how much of that was the Vikings coming out really flat after the big win, the miracle win against the Saints, and all week you know kind of feeling that they were really lucky to get to where they were after that Saints game, and uh, I mean there's a lot of ways to to look at this. And, and the other thing that you and I have always said is, you know, you don't make a living betting against the Patriots, but you have all the makings of great storylines with this one because so many people hate the Patriots because of how good they are. I shouldn't say hate them. They're just, like you said, they're tired of seeing the same team winning the Super Bowl. They're, they're tired of seeing that how great they are every every year. They're either in it or winning it. Uh, so, so people want to see that. The, the king get knocked off the throne and uh, that's what kind of makes it and then you have the the underdog Nick Foles who's been an underdog all along and you have a city that hasn't won a championship in, in more than a half a century so yeah it, this has got all kind of the earmarks of being one of the most uh, you know intriguing matchups that we've had in a long time you've kind of convinced me I've been um, you know I was a big fan of the Eagles when it opened at six and a half and it immediately got that down to six. And then all of a sudden it was five and a half. And then it got to a little bit of five. So where are you now? I'm at five and a half, but very close to go. I'm more close to going to five. Is it possible we're going to get a Super Bowl line change on the podcast? <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> You're not going to do that. Well, I mean, unless, unless you know, we get another big bet you know in the next 30 minutes i mean if it's coming in i've got my little bet ticker here when i when i see the bets coming in i'll it's possible can you explain i was having a conversation with someone yesterday um i felt better about betting the pats or betting the eagles at six and six and a half than i do at five and a half um or even five just because i feel like those are relatively dead numbers and then i sort of forgot why i felt that way <laughs> you, you you forgot why you felt that five's a dead number, or, or yeah, like why why am I less comfortable betting at five than I am at six? Other than I know the difference between like betting yeah. at five and six, but just, explain yeah, the concept it, of a dead number to people. Well, I mean, uh, most games in the NFL are obviously decided by three points. Uh, I haven't seen the, the recent stats in the last year, but at one point it was as high as 14% of all the NFL games were decided by three points. And it didn't matter what the point spread of the game was. It just meant that that's how many games were decided by three points. The next uh, most common number, obviously, is seven. And then from there it goes to uh, uh, four and then ten. And then there's certain different margins of victory that it just doesn't occur a whole lot. So like two, you don't see a whole lot of games landing, uh, you know, 22 to 20 or, you know, 30, 32 to 32 is just one of those numbers that doesn't occur a whole lot. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but the likelihood is of it is much lower. So two is a dead number. Five is a dead number. Uh, typically eight, was another dead number, uh, but we're starting to see more frequencies of uh, uh, teams winning by by eight than, than ten years ago. Uh, so so that's the concept, and sometimes it comes back to bite us because uh, uh, I'll go back to that Saints Vikings game, where because five is a dead number, a lot of times if they if they laid four and a half, I'd go straight to five and a half, and if they took five and a half, I'd go straight to four and a half, and I would skip five. Uh, the 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 logic being if if a professional better is betting fifty thousand at minus four and a half, then you know chances are he's going to lay five too because it's basically the same number. So that one came back to bite me because if, as we all remember, they didn't kick that extra point and uh, the Vikings win by five. So so that that 
wasn't the greatest of results, uh, but but that's what happens. And um, uh, we we try to move lines around those dead numbers. While you were talking, I put a uh, hundred dollars on the Eagles plus five and a half. <laughs> I mean, the, the, what you have to do is basically say who's going to win the game because about 75% of the time, if you know who's going to win the game, the point spread really isn't that relevant. It's not very often where you're going to say, okay, I think the Patriots are going to win the game, but they're only going to win by three. That's pretty precise handicapping. I think you have to approach this. If you think the Eagles have a good shot of winning the game, uh, then just take the five points. And then if they get unlucky and the Patriots score a touchdown to, to win it and they win by three or four, then you, you, you still still win the game plus your five and a half. I'm buying Nick Foles, my friend. Don't let yeah. me down. You have convinced me <laughs> that Nick Foles is the way to go. Don't let me down. <laughs> and I'll tell you something. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> who sang that? Oh, who? ELO. Uh, ELO. Yeah. Was that Michael Grinnell who came in with that, or was that you, Scooch? That was me. <laughs> Grinnell was continuing continuing his streak of just not listening to the podcast. He's like, I'm good just for him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's like, yeah. at one point, like it's you know, sometimes when I'm on a, when I'm on a conference call, I can sort of half fall asleep and know like when like there's a pause, it might be my turn to speak, but. That's like how Grinnell was producing the podcast. See, right I now. resent like, that. I resent that. I listen to every single podcast from start to finish, sitting on the edge of my chair the whole time. I, I don't like the insults. Wow. <laughs> wow. Good for you, Mike. Wow. I like that. <laughs> Grinnell. Good for Grinnell coming after yeah. me. He's a professional. He's a true professional. He is, he is dictating this podcast which, by the way, has generally seen like 30% growth since we started it. Really? That's fantastic. It's amazing. Yeah. We've gone from me listening to it to me, you, and Grinnell listening to it. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. Uh, listen, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go uh, listen to Jeff Schwartz for a little while. And then you're going to come back and we're going to talk a little bit more about this Super Bowl. We're going to take a couple more Twitter questions um, and we're going to see if there's a prop out there that we like, even though you haven't posted anything yet. Joining me now on the buffet to talk about sports betting from an NFL player perspective from inside the locker room. Jeff Schwartz, eight year NFL lineman. Uh, he is a host of a radio show on the NFL station on Sirius. That's channel 88. I believe. Isn't that right, Jeff? Yeah, 88. Um, I do Mad Dog Radio and ESPNU. And there's a Pac-12 station coming up soon, so I'll be on that too. Dude, I haven't even gotten through the whole thing. I was just trying to make sure I got the first thing right. Well, I don't. the other ones, I, I can't list everything all on the one Twitter page. It's okay, though. I, understand. I was going to – he writes for SB Nation. He's got a book called Eat My Schwartz that he wrote with his brother, another NFL lineman. Um, most importantly – Jeff is going to be one of the analysts on the Pickapalooza live streaming show that we are we are broadcasting from the Action Network social handles. Jeff, I think we want to broadcast it from your social handle as well. Um, we can. We will, tri- we will triple the audience just by doing that. And uh, Pickapalooza, it's on Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday. We are going 30 minutes before the game. We are going live at halftime to talk about all the props and bets that have cashed. And um, the one's still remaining, and then we'll do 15 minutes after the game, too. Jeff is going to be on that, talking about everything from the NFL player perspective. I think that's enough. Jeff, how are you, buddy? Oh, I'm good. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to, to get this show going. I enjoy gambling. I feel like that's taboo to say, but I do. Well, we're trying to make it not taboo to say at the Action Network. We're trying to make people feel comfortable. That's the whole goal is, like, to bring the conversation out of the shadows. How much do you think, like, you enjoy gambling – how afraid of talking about gambling were you when you were a player? Well, we don't talk about it. I mean, it's in the locker room. It says, you know, gambling is forbidden. We know, like, that's almost the golden rule of any sports locker room is gambling is forbidden. And I understand why it is. And so it's never really talked about. And I always, 
it's kind of in my blood. Like my my grandfather, he passed away before I was born, but he was bigger than the horses. My mom's told me forever. Um, and just in general nature, I am more of a gambler. Like I've taken risks on my own career, taken one year deals, and I always kind of need that competition as well. And so it was never really talked about, but it was something I knew that I wanted to do when I finished playing. And in the locker room, I think the only time you ever know about it is when you're the underdog. We've seen with the Eagles the last two weeks, right? I mean, they embrace the underdog role wearing the, the German Shepherd dog mask. And it's it's not openly talked about though every week. You know, if you're if you're a 10 point favorite, you don't say we're a 10 point favorite. You might assume that you're gonna hold not assume, but hope to win the game. But really, the underdog thing is talked about a bunch. And the line is never mentioned, though. The coach doesn't say, you know, we're seven and a half point dogs and people only expect us to score 17 points. They you know, just say we're underdogs. You know, like everyone expects us to lose. Um, and that's mainly where it's talked about. All right. Of all the coaches you've had, I want to. I thought yesterday's games were really interesting. And there's been a lot of, from a gambling perspective, um, we should get to the fact that, like, you know what? reframe hold on you gave me like 10 questions i wanted to ask and there were a bunch of things i want to get to which we will but first one of the things you told me before we jumped on the show was how excited you were to gamble once you got out of the nfl so how did your gambling habit manifest and do you still have a home uh, yes, I still have a home. Um, so a buddy of mine used a website that he, he gambled on and I, I held out for a while just cause I, you know, I was still trying to play and, and I, you know, obviously I'm not going to gamble if I'm still playing. And so when I retired, um, or when I basically knew, I, I knew there was a time period when I was done. I, I didn't, I, I didn't announce my retirement for a while, but it was pretty obvious. And we stopped telling, we stopped calling teams and, and, um, I shut my workouts down a little bit early. Like I, I was done and I still have not, you don't have to sign official paperwork to be retired in the NFL. Um, you just have to tell them you're done essentially. And they send you your severance check eventually. Um, and so that's kind of what happened. And so I just started doing it, uh, real casually last very toward the end of last year, really a lot in the playoffs and the, um, in the bowl season, um, was when I really started doing it last year and just five, $10, maybe $3 on a prop bet here and there. Uh, I did decently well last year. Um, no, but last, last playoffs too, all the favorites won. It wasn't very hard to pick, um, you know, to pick, uh, the winners, all the, the best quarterbacks won every game. And then this NFL year has been a very odd year, but I still have my house. Um, and, uh, so things are still going well. Well, we're going to do what we can to change that for you. Um, do you feel like you know more because you played in the NFL when you are thinking about these games, do you think about it? Let me rephrase this question. I'm doing a lot of that right now. When you are thinking about betting on these games, are you thinking about it as an NFL strategy, from an NFL strategy perspective as a player, or are you just thinking about it based on the analysis that you're seeing that everybody else sees? Um, I quite honestly don't really look at analysis when I when I gamble, which is probably my <laughs> fault. I mean, like I just like I I I just do it myself um, because. I feel like I played. I should know what's happening, which is probably my fault. I mean, I probably should look at. There's times I have a couple of friends that I talk to who who do this full time, and I'll make a pick and, and I'll ask them like, "Is this a good pick?" And they're like, "No." Like that's a exact opposite of the trend or whatever it is. I'm like, "Oh well, whoops." I, I, I and that's kind of my problem is like I'll see a game or I'll see a prop bet. And I'm like, "This is you know, if a team wants to win this way, they have to do it this way." And of course, it's the exact opposite. Um, and I mean, that's I think the fun of it. Even the game last night, it's you know, thirty eight. Seven. I'm sitting there hoping the Eagles can kick a last minute field goal to cover my prop bet for the Eagles field goals. Like I'm just, I think it adds another dimension to the game. But I think it is. I I probably should pay attention more to the to the people that know the business. But I think it's more fun just to look at games, look at props, think about how I would do it as a player or, or a coach or what I think the game's going to turn out to be, and, and bet that way. All right. So you played eight years in the NFL. Uh, which coach did you have that you think would have been most likely to be a hardcore rip roaring gambler <laughs> if he was not coaching in the NFL? Not Tom Coughlin. Um, no. Not Andy Reid. Um, I would have probably go with John Fox. Yeah. I could yeah. totally see that. Yeah. Um, you know, Andy Reid is, you know, it's, it's, I, I love Andy. My brother plays for the Chiefs now. Uh, he's a great coach. He's a great person. Uh, I enjoy playing with him. But, yeah, you, you kind of always have to bet against him in the playoffs. It's kind of <laughs> Seriously, like, 
what is with that? Why can he not manage the clock? I don't understand it. You can almost, you can count on that in every single way that he is not going to know how to manage any time-based situation. So the one, this is the one thing that I've I've noticed now covering. Well, I don't cover the Chiefs, but since I follow them so much, since I I played there for years, I know how he does things. Andy Reid is one of the most brilliant minds at designing a game plan that I've ever been around. As far and then the first fifteen, so coaches script out the first fifteen plays and base down on distance. Third down is obviously going to be different, a red zone and things like that. But just general down on distance, the best I've ever seen, the best I've been a part of. Um, you know, the 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 first third down call, the first goal call, everything that. Uh, that huge play card, a lot of it's scripted out. It's when things don't go very well or things go off the script. I've seen him have a little trouble dealing with, which is surprising to me because, you know, coaches cover everything. And this is what makes Bill Belichick, by the way, so great is that he don't care about adjusting. Like he doesn't care if he has to, to do something different that was not in his game plan. And that's what I found Andy Reid has had issues with. And, you know, some of it stems from just his general philosophy of wanting to pass the ball so much. Um, he doesn't, doesn't want to run the ball. And that's, you know, Doug Peterson is obviously a disciple of Andy Reid in the West Coast offense. And we've seen Doug do things differently where he's run the ball when he's had to. And, you know, he found ways to win with Nick Foles. So I love Andy, but I think it's just kind of when things don't go well, he, he doesn't go back to his basics. Um, and that's where he loses out some of these games. I don't think it's a clock management issue. I just think that that's – that's his deal is when he just he, he just tries to do too much when maybe doing the basics is better. Well, you actually answered – it's actually – I made it too simple. The truth is it's not a clock management issue, but that's the superficial result of what you're talking about because those are scenarios where you need to be the most nimble and the most creative and the most flexible, and he is unable to sort of make that switch in his brain to something that needs to be off scheme for a minute. Right, which is so surprising to me because – He's a brilliant offensive mind, and this is—it's not just—and this is a, not just an Andy Reid thing. I think it's a, a lot of a lot of people, a lot of coaches have this problem. I mean, I follow the Giants. Ben McAdoo had this issue. Um, you know, the Jacksonville Jaguars yesterday. And now the Jaguars, yeah. but the Jaguars—that's a lot of it's not Blake Bortles though. He's not—he—you can't do much more than what they did the first half with him. Um, and and I'm so interested to see if Pat Mahomes in Kansas City will bring that maybe out more in Andy. We'll, we'll get Andy to be more aggressive, but it's human nature to kind of back things down when you have a lead. And Andy, Andy Reid's always done that. And he's, uh, he's an OC man. OCs get paid to pass the football. They don't get paid to run the football. All right. So for a long time, I've covered gambling and professional bettors have always told me that the two coaches for a long time, who only the only two coaches who made a difference in the point spread were North Turner for the Chargers in a negative way, and Bill Belichick Uh-oh. for the Patriots in a positive way. You look at the league right now, who are the coaches that you think make the biggest, let me rephrase again, it's like I can't, I, you know what the problem is, I never have like a real athlete on the, on, the, <laughs> on the show, so like you can answer questions in a much more broader way, but what coaches do you think have the biggest impact in game, and how much can coaches actually impact what's happening in game if they're sort of between the Andy Reid can't make the change and Bill Belichick can change everything. Well, I think we saw this year. I mean, obviously Kyle Shanahan and, and Garoppolo, um, uh, that made a big difference in, in the, in what happened in San Francisco. Um, you know, Bill Belichick, uh, you know, Ron Rivera is really good at the end of the season. I mean, the, the Panthers win a lot of games. I'm not sure they cover the spread or not, but they they're really really good in in November December. So is Cam Noon. So I don't. I mean that just comes to mind because I live in Charlotte and um, I, I don't know who who affects the line maybe more than Belichick. That North Turner thing is interesting because he's now in Charlotte as the uh, the Panthers offensive coordinator. Um, so I have to be the lookout of that now, now that I live here. Yeah. Um, uh, and the the second question about the, that was what? Oh, uh, who is sort of in the middle? Oh, okay. How much do coaches really make? How actually? How much can coaches make a difference if they're not at either of those polar ends? So this is yeah. This is kind of comes back to this idea of adjustments, and I people love the the term adjustments. What what, what, do, what do teams do? What adjustments? Okay, so um, it it adjustments are very subtle, and they're not something where you just draw on a whiteboard at halftime. You have like three minutes to talk to each other at halftime. By the time halftime starts, you get in the locker room, you get settled in, you go to the bathroom, you meet with your coaches. Like It's not a lot of time. So you 
the the best coaches are able to to be able to dissect what's happening on the field and give you a diagnosis really quickly in the locker room at halftime of how we're going to attack something different. And you have this large playbook, and then you 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 pare it down for for the game. And then within the the game plan, you know you you like certain plays, you don't like certain plays. So it's the coaches that can get to the plays on the game plan that work against that defense or, or vice versa. Um, instead of just sticking with what you think is going to happen, those are the, are the best coaches. So there's not a lot of adjustments made. I mean, the you know, for example, the Patriots yesterday just brought more pressure in the second half. It's not like they drew them up on the chalkboard. They just decided, look, we need to pressure Blake, Blake Bortles so he doesn't get a free reign um, in the backfield. Or, or they started chipping um, to help the right tackle out. Little things like that. Um, and you know, and that you know that that's funny enough. Like when you when you when you have to use a running back to chip. He's not going to get as many yards receiving or receptions. So that's like another angle to look at if you're prop betting for a running back is if you think the team's going to use a lot of chips that game, bet the under for a lot of that stuff. Well, how do you know if a team's going to do a lot of chips that game? Like, how do you find well, that out? Um, well, it's just a, it's a, it's an educated guess. I mean, I, I if you think like I like. For example, I thought New England's offensive line would be fine yesterday, and they pretty much were, were okay. And they would throw a lot of empty stuff at Jacksonville, and the backs would get involved. But it it, did, it, it made sense for them to chip. They've always done it. They, they've done a good job at it. Some teams just do it, and some teams don't. Um, like the Eagles, the Eagles don't. You know, the Eagles do it often to to Vitae, the left tackle. Um, you know, the Patriots. I think this game will have to do a lot of chipping because of the of the defensive ends. Um, and when you chip with running backs, they often don't get a lot of reception yards unless it's screen passes um, because they're not. You know, they're not often downfield to, to catch a long pass, and then they're really not even in the route. So you know, the the passes downfield tend to be a little bit longer, um, and they just don't get as many receptions as usual. So let's talk about the games yesterday for a second because. Um, I saw you going off on people on Twitter on Twitter about the refs. People were complaining about the refs in the Jags Patriots game. You made some really salient points about the opportunities the Jags missed. What is your assessment of what happened yesterday? Um. So I, to me, you know the uh, the Jaguars have one way to win, and that way to win is what they showed the first half. They have to play great defense, which they did. They have to run the football, which they did. And Blake Bortles wins a certain way, which is a lot of play action pass, a lot of move, move the pocket type action. He's not going to be a, just a drop back passer. And, you know, when that's in the second half, New England said, we're not letting you do that. So they brought a lot of pressure. They stopped the run and Jacksonville just couldn't handle that. And then the other way around, you know, obviously the Gronk injury was huge. Um, but, you no, know, New England's down twenty to ten. It's third and eighteen against the pass, you know, the best pass defense, the best pass rush, and they convert. And look, you can blame the refs all you want. Um, I thought for the most part they were fantastic yesterday. In general, I think they're they're they get a lot of grief, but they're generally pretty good. They let a lot of things go yesterday, both in both games, even in the New England game. There was six penalties for Jacksonville. Five of them, there's no question about. Church hit Gronk in the head. There were three procedural penalties, a, a DPI on Ramsey, which he didn't even argue. So one was the one on Bouye. Uh, I think that the refs at that time was after the Gronk hit were probably a little bit on, not on edge, but a little bit more likely to call a penalty in that situation um, just because they had just thrown their flags and, and Gronk had been knocked out. Um, and so that's it. Like they, they didn't call holding. They called one holding on Jack Hill's offensive line, but it was declined. Um, and, that's it. So I don't know what the re- people who think the refs are are in the bag for the Patriots or anyone else. Think about this: the NFL suspended Brady four games for a un- for a a uh, equipment violation, right? So look, they, they, the, the refs aren't in this for for the Patriots. It's a lazy take. It's a salty take. Um, I don't like it. It's not the way it works. And it also diminishes the role that the players have in the game because the players win and lose games. Coaches win and lose games. Referees very, very rarely lose a game for you. Um, I've never been around a coach, a player who comes in on Monday and says, we lost the game or we won the game because of the refs. It doesn't work like that. Have you ever been around a coach or a player who comes in on Monday and says, we lost the game because that ref is on the take? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, no. Have you um, had a chance to think about what Rob Gronkowski is worth from a point spread perspective versus a on the field perspective? This is like a hot take in the sports betting community. 
because Rob Gronkowski, arguably one of the most valuable players outside of the quarterback position. So, Ballpark, what do you think Rob Gronkowski is worth from the point spread perspective? You know, the funny thing is the Patriots kind of play well without him. <laughs> um, a couple points. I mean, like players typically outside a quarterback are not worth, what, more than one point a game? Really? You I mean, basically, you're basically nailing it. Uh, you, you've you just said three things without knowing that prove you played in the NFL. Number one, the Patriots do really well without Rob Gronkowski. Well, it's true, especially against the spread. They have far exceeded expectations of what you would think of a player of his caliber. That's number one. Number two, yeah, nobody in the NFL is worth more than a point except for the quarterbacks. And Gronkowski generally gets graded as about a point. And in reality, he's probably worth zero to half a point. Right. I mean, it's, but I would say as, as a, like if I was on offense and Gronk didn't play, just generally speaking, not to the Patriots, like if I was on the team, but you think like, man, we probably lost ourselves a touchdown today. Like, like that's like, I would think that that was the way uh, an offense would think about that. Right. But it generally <laughs> doesn't matter. Like be, maybe because he's on the Patriots, they do so well and achieve at such a high level and perform at such a high level that Gronk is out, Brady and Belichick can't stand each other, the whole place is falling apart. It kind of doesn't matter because they get on the field and they are so inhuman that they do Correct. exactly what they're supposed to do. Correct. It's, a, it's remarkable. I mean, Brady, look, people will hate on, on the Patriots, which I know they'd love to do, but he's a lot of fun to watch and he's very good at his job. So I don't know why you'd want to hate on the best. And I just don't get it. I, I did you really want to see Blake Bortles in, in the Super Bowl? Did you really want to see that? Come on. No, 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 not at all. But people I mean, did. I don't, well, it's silly. Like I want to see Blake Bortles cause I had a pretty decent sized future bet on the Jaguars to get to the Super Bowl. Um, <laughs> okay. And at about five minutes left in the game yesterday, my wife came down and I'm watching the game in the kitchen and I, uh, She's like, hey, you know, Zach, our older son, he's in high school, freshman in high school. He's got midterms. He's like, he really needs help with this one thing. Can you help him with his studying? He's working on it right now. I'm like, how long? I'm like, can I do it in a little bit? She goes, well, how long? I'm like, well, if the Jaguars win this game, we're going to win several thousand dollars. She goes, she goes, all right, it's just five minutes. I think we can watch the, re- the end of the game. Like, that's where we put our perspective is the Jaguars. We really wanted him to go to the Super Bowl. But other than that, I totally want Tom Brady. Uh, no, that, and it's weird when you gamble for things, you root for different, like I try not to gamble on the chiefs cause that's, I root for them with my brother there. Like that's, that's hard to do to, to, root, to root for them and also root for different things with gambling outcomes. So I typically just take the chiefs with the points, no matter what, you know, everyone talks about hating on the Patriots. Do players hate on the Patriots? Like when you're in the locker room, are you guys talking about how amazing Tom Brady is? Um, I don't know if in the locker room, I mean, no, but you think you see all the guys that just go play there all the time that want to win a championship. I mean, that's well, like, obvious. But do players in the locker room talk about other players as fans or do you only see them as rivals and people that you have to beat? That's a good question. Um, I, I don't, I think we don't know if we're looking at rivals, but if a guy's good, we'll say he's good. I mean, if we play a defensive lineman who's good, now I I would try. I, the way I, I treat everyone is I just thought every defensive lineman sucked. It was the way that I kind of got myself ready to play. Um, and obviously, if they're good, they would show me on the field. Um, but I think generally, if you're a good player, I mean, you, we enjoy watching good good guys play. I mean, there were times I'd assume during games if someone made a great play on another team, I turned to another buddy and was like, "Wow, that's a great catch." I mean, I'm sure I said that from time to time. But like. LeBron James is on Instagram liking every single thing that, like, here's a Steph Curry photo. It's LeBron right. James likes it. Right. Here's Dwayne Wade. Loves it. Russell Westbrook. Loves it. I, I don't see I that with the NFL. The, the NFL, though, is not as um, as brotherly as the NBA is. I mean, these guys work out together. They go in banana boats together. Uh, <laughs> look, we're – well, you might be friendly with other opponents, which is fine and, and whatever, but you were in a physical combat. I mean, we're in three hours of of pain and violence and and physicality and, and confrontation and you know, we're shit talking to each other. Like I don't think you can be that friendly during the season to your opponent. Um 
I, after the season, sure. I mean, you know, Von Miller has all the dudes up and they're doing pass rushing camp. I worked out with Charles Bentley in Arizona with a bunch of offensive linemen for three years. You can be friendly then. You can be friendly before the game, after the game. Uh, but I just, I don't think that we're liking each other's Instagram photos. I don't think we, a lot of us do that type of thing. No, you clearly don't. It's not a brotherhood at all. It's a man wants to kill man, uh, not fraternal in any way. That's right. what I think. That's what okay. I think. Oh, it's hundred and and it's uh. I mean, now that I look at it, like I I don't miss playing really at all. I, I miss the feeling of winning. That's about it. But sometimes I think to myself, like, wow, I really played that game for eight years. I, you watch it, you're like, it's it's so violent, and um, all the injuries I've had, and I just watch sometimes, like, just in awe that I did this for eight years, and I still feel really good. There was a story once in the New Yorker. Um, and Jeff Saturday, I think it was Jeff Saturday, was quoted in it saying, like, at the end of a long drive at the goal line, he's only seeing stars. Like, he doesn't see anything in front of him. He's only seeing stars, and everything he's doing is basically off of muscle memory. I might be making up who said it. I might be making up the entire scenario, but it sounds like it's something that I read. Do you – did you ever have feelings like that? Like, was it just like – was oh, every play like a Rob Gronkowski play like yesterday? Uh, no, no, I mean, not every play is like that, especially in the trenches. You don't feel you don't get those, those impacts. You get them, you know, kind of slowly over time, uh, playing that position. But I will say that when you get tired, it comes down to just the muscle memory. I mean, you just, you just play, uh, you're exhausted and you just do it cause you've done it for so long and it's ingrained in you and you, you don't even really know what you're doing. You just, the ball gets snapped and you play. And, and that happens not every game, but it happens every you know, couple times throughout the year when you're just so tired you just go have to go back to muscle memory and and go ahead and, and do just do your job. You would be amazing. This will be an interesting experiment for uh, experiment for us for the uh, live stream show that we're doing on Super Bowl Sunday. Um, in game wagering because you might be able to tell. Oh, these guys are getting tired, and like if it comes down to four or five plays, your analysis of what could happen on those four or five plays based on what you're able to see would be really fascinating from a prediction and betting perspective. Yeah, I like doing the in-game, uh, the in-game, th- a lot of it in college football. Because if you're if you're like a home favorite and you're losing at halftime, you typically come back and play better in the second half. Uh, the NFL is, I think, tougher to do. Um, unless, you know, like yesterday, you know, I, I don't know what the, the, the Patriots probably, when they're down 14 to three, I mean, I don't, they're probably weren't even favored by then. You, I mean, you, you no, they weren't, some, they were four and a half point underdogs. At that yeah. Point. I, I should have put some money on that. I mean, with Jacksonville, you could always assume they're going to kind of not blow it, but you saw what happened with Pittsburgh and new England keeps coming back to win these games. Like, I think that situation when, when there's an, a big favorite who's down early, that's when you jump in and get some in game action. Yeah. Maybe we're going to work on that for Super Bowl Sunday. Let's make some money, Jeff. I want to make some. I I I would like to make some money. I need to make some money after the season. I got to make some bank. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I didn't win that Jags bet, and I got my kid going through midterms. God knows how that's going to go. If he's going to make it through school, like I got to <laughs> I got to make your, some money. What's your initial? What's your initial thought on the line? My initial thought is that uh, five. It's now down to five. It opened at six and a half in some places, six most places. It got bet down to five and a half last night. This is Monday afternoon. Um, it's now down to five. And my feeling is that clearly that's some wise guy money coming in on the Eagles because most people are betting the Patriots and that I am not comfortable betting this game at five. It feels like a Patriots four to five point win. And so if that's where the number is going to settle, then I'm going to have to find another way to get some action on the game. I should have taken it last night, six and a half. I should have taken the Eagles. I was sa- same boat as you. Yeah. I think the, Eagle, the Eagles are too good on their lines, running the, running the ball to make this game a blowout. And New England really has not blown out many teams this year. Um, well, they, they, they play a lot of the good teams close because New England, Philadelphia is more talented than New England. I mean, Jacksonville is more talented. They just have a better. You know, New England has the Hall of Fame quarterback, and Jacksonville had Blake Bortles. I don't know why I have to be so mean to Blake Bortles. I'm not, I don't understand what that's that's mean. My job is just to I say I say what I am not. I don't attack the person. He could he's a hurt. He's a great guy. I don't I don't never met him before, but he's not going to be a starting quarterback next year. No, you're probably right. I was really rooting for him though. I felt like you know you're you're a winner. Like you're a big guy who played in the Pac-12 and then got to play in the NFL. Guys like me 
you know, scrappy little guys from the North Shore of Chicago, we have to find our champions anywhere we can. I understand it, and I, but I was not. It's not like I was a, a big time recruit, or I didn't have. I mean, I'm an underdog too. I was seventh round draft pick. I've been injured eight times. I've uh, been cut a couple times. I mean, it wasn't always easy. I, I'm not. This is people think this way. Like I'm not a under. I don't root for underdogs very often. So why not? Why are you against underdogs? You're like no. I think that I, people have gone in such a direction now where they only root for the underdog for the good story for everything to, to be fair and that everyone have a chance. I think I've gone the opposite <laughs> direction. We're like I'm just like screw this. I want the best. Plus, typically the best like watching Alabama play Clemson and then uh, um, Clemson and then watching them play Georgia. That's infinitely better than watching them play UCF. Like they would have destroyed UCF. I don't want to see that. Even if UCF makes it close for a little bit, or even if they win, I don't want to see that. I want to see the best teams play in the best games, in the biggest games. Like the 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 best team in the AFC won yesterday, and I I think we're, it's debatable if the well the Eagles showed they're probably better than the Falcons than than, than than the Vikings yesterday. But I want to watch the best teams play. I don't know why why people don't want to do that. I'm with you. I actually root for history. Like whenever no one's like, oh, don't you want to see this big upset? I'm like, no. If there's a chance for someone to make a history defining win, that's what I want to see. I want to see the Patriots win as many Super Bowls as they can. I want to see them get to as many Super Bowls as they can. That's I, I, I want to see the Warriors win 74 games every single year. You know what I mean? Like that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in dominance. Right. So that's why I don't root for underdogs. I could have been well, an offensive lineman. I'm, that's what I'm I probably will root for the Eagles, though, because I, I've covered them this year for the Athletic, and I, I really like w- what their team has done this year. So I might root for the Eagles, but if the Patriots win, I won't care. All right, here's my last question before I let you go. Um, Chip Kelly, when he, w- he was your offensive coordinator, right? Yes. So when he was your offensive coordinator and then when he became the head coach, Oregon was known – for always being an over team and always scoring enough points to cover. Like they were like, there was this period of the chip Kelly era where like bookmakers could just count on him doing both of those things. How soon before you think it's like that at UCLA? Um, you know, I, they have to get a, probably a year of their own guys in there. When I was at, when I was at Oregon, we kind of had a spread team already waiting. We had Dennis Dixon there, obviously his first year. Um, but in the pac 10, I mean, excuse me, pac 12, I mean, you could bet the overs all the time, right? I mean, that's kind of like, if, especially if it's a pack yes. after dark. If it's pack twelve after dark, hammer the over. There's a, you, you, you get almost guaranteed the win. I mean, how many games that the Pac twelve has a night that are, are, you know, that are fourteen to seven? They're always like 38, 35 or forty two, forty four, or some crazy number. Um, it's gonna be close. It's gonna be soon. I mean, he's gonna score a lot of points. The the, the thing I'm, I I will caution people about is. You know, when we did it at Oregon, we were the first to do this as far as incorporate the tempo into the spread offense. Now everyone does it, so it's not as unique. So what can Chip bring that's a little bit different now to UCLA now that everyone does his offense? Right. It's it's a challenge for him, and he's going to have to figure it out if for no other reason than people want to get back to betting on Chip Kelly. I didn't know that that was that. Was, I mean, Orkin this year when when Herbert was in there, they were they were uh, hitting the over all the time. Listen, back in the day, like you could, the bookmakers couldn't make the spreads high enough or the totals high enough. Even with like Andrew Luck, the spread would be Stanford by twenty five, and people would still be hitting Stanford minus twenty five because in the Pac twelve that year, like every single team that was ranked in the top ten was covering by. Just massive margins, and, and then when you know when Oregon played Stanford too, it was like fifty five thirty seven, like no defense, no none at all. It's like it's, it's like a college basketball game. Wasn't there a thing where I saw that most of the the highest over under totals that have been set have been like Pac twelve games? And they always are over. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> That's where you can start making your money. Just betting Pac. I mean, eventually they're they're gonna set a line like a hundred and two, and you might have to take the under, the under in that. Nope, go over. You can't Always win over. by going under. Just go over, man. We'll what? talk about that. We'll talk shoot, about that when we spend the day shoot, together man. in the studio doing our live stream show. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Jeff. Yeah, thank you. Talk to you. Okay, we're back. I promise more Twitter questions. Plus, we're going to get to a prop that Scooch is going to post that he and I will uh, have a Scooch roulette pick on. Uh, this is from Sam Wilkin. 
Sam Wilkin. A wide receiver has only won the Super Bowl MVP six times. Where does the Orleans have receivers listed in their odds? And why may why might they have better or worse odds than some of the running backs in the game? So I'll I'll take you a little bit off the hook here and saying that you don't have these up yet. Um okay. So, but if you're posting receivers, where would you put them? And why might they have better or worse odds than some of the running backs? Uh, well, I think they're just going to make more of a difference in, in this kind of passing game that we're in, especially with these two teams, with, uh, with two teams that put up a lot of points uh, and, and rely a lot on the, the, the tight ends and, and the wide receivers. So uh, we are going to see... Brady will be the, the, the favorite. Foles will be the, the, the right around the second favorite. And then we'll have, uh, you know, Gronkowski and we'll have all the, the, the receivers. So uh, much more much more chance of, uh, of a receiver getting the MVP um, than, than a running back. I, I just think there's more opportunity for them to catch the game-winning touchdown or get the big play that puts them in, uh, in range. So, and I think that... I mean, really, it's all about the quarterbacks now, <laughs> but but I think wide receivers and tight ends are second and third. Do you think Danny Amendola, uh, do you think the public is going to be all over Danny Amendola because of what he did in the conference title game? To win the MVP? Yes. I, I, I mean, if they get if, if he's more than uh, 20 to 1, then, then I could say they'll get some action. People do like to take the long shots that have a good chance rather than take – the, the obvious ones like Brady, where you're only going to get, you know, two to one or three to one. So um, if, if he's longer than 20 to one, we, we might get some action. We'll probably get more action on Amadol to, to, you know, to win the MVP. But um, he's, an, he's another one that will draw some action. I'm going with Jay Ajayi. Ajayi. I was, I was going to say him. I, I figured you would. If you like the Eagles and you like uh, you're kind of a contrarian, you know, you're going to throw away the the quarterback of the receivers. You're, you're that kind of guy. Well, that's, you know, I'm looking next level, dude. That's what I do. I look next level. Yeah. And Jay Ajayi, uh, that's how Joe Buck says it. Um, I don't know if that's how you say his name. But uh, he is a guy who is going to get a lot of touches. And that Patriots defense, if they're lacking in one thing, it's sort of the ability to stop the run, even though they did a really nice job on Leonard Fournette. Uh, I do think that the Eagles will open up and try to control the running game and try to control the clock and put Nick Foles in positions to make the passes he needs to make uh, when they need to be made and not have to win the game. So um, that's what I'm going with. What do you think of that? That is my that is my very hot take thought of while I'm sitting here talking to you. I don't think – I don't like it, and I'll tell you why. Mm. <laughs> I, think, I think the Patriots and Belichick are going to try and shut down the run and force Nick Foles to take center stage on the biggest stage in sports to, to force him to, to make the plays because, it, yes, he's been doing it and he's been overcoming the odds, but I, I think they shut down the run and, and, let, him, uh, and let him pass and, short, and, and, and make the game longer, stretch out the game. Just the opposite of, of, a, of a ball control team that's trying to shorten the, the game to not let Brady uh, uh, be on the field a lot. I think I think Belichick will want to do the opposite, create a lot of passing and a lot of uh, and create more plays in the game, which means more chance for, of Brady being on the field to score. If you're betting this game right now, are you betting on the Patriots? Uh, no, <laughs> uh, I wouldn't lay five and a half points. Uh, I. This is really a toss-up. I mean, for for me, this was a tough one because, like I said, from from an odds point, we were looking at seven, and I kept adjusting it down, down, down. So obviously, I feel the the, the Eagles are a live dog, uh, but uh, I, I'm I'm just looking at handicapping a game, especially if you're looking at uh, propositions. You know, you can. You can try and handicap the outcome of a game like based on like how you would do a horse race and say, OK, this horse is going to take the lead and around the stretch, he's going to run second, allow this horse to pass. And you could be right exactly on how the horse race is run, but still not have the winning horse. So you can do the same thing in the Super Bowl and try to try to handicap how the game is going to be played out. And then that will determine how many yards this receiver has and how many pass attempts the quarterback has. Even if you don't pick the winner outright, the, the team that wins the game, you can still be right on how the game is being played out and whether there's more points in the second half or the first half. Um, so, so that kind of thing. 
Live dog. <laughs> Uh, all right, Scooch. So I think we're both going to end up being on the same side eventually, because yeah. Yeah. Yeah, as you know, I, I've uh, already bet on the Eagles at plus five and a half. You just did, yeah. And I think we probably are going to be on the same side. You know, the interesting thing about the way they're betting this, at least right now, is the opposite of how they usually bet a Super Bowl. Meaning, usually when there's like a four point uh, line or a six point line, the public will lay the favorite. And the people that like the underdog will bet them to win the game straight up on the on the money line, and those sports books do really well typically if the favorite wins the game by one or two but doesn't cover the point spread. This is right now seems to be the opposite. The people that are betting the Patriots are betting the Patriots on the money line. So we so we're a little heavy on the Patriots money line, and the people that are betting the Eagles are taking the points. So now we have the chance of getting a little middled if Patriots win by a field goal because we're going to lose all that money line bets on the Patriots and all the point line bets on the Eagles. Interesting. Listen, it isn't. No, it is interesting. It's fascinating, but I think it speaks to this game, right? Nick Foles yeah. is the X factor. When you got Nick yes. Foles as the X factor, it changes everything. And I think that's a gambling philosophy through the history of time. Nick yeah. Foles is the X factor and he changes everything. <laughs> the unknown. Yeah, he is. He is Napoleon Dynamite of the NFL. <laughs> so listen in the spirit of the get your prop up in vegas contest that we are doing in which people can send in their um suggestions at props contest at actionnetwork.com that is props contest at actionnetwork.com send in your prop idea if we like it it will go on the board at the orleans we will take a picture of it we will send it to you and we will have you on the podcast um, in the spirit of that, Scooch, give me an idea of like one prop you're going to post in the next 24 to 36 hours that would be your Scooch roulette prop pick. And um, I'll weigh in with my opinion on your choice. Time to take down the hops. When all hope is lost, all that's left is relief. Let's play Scooch roulette. Okay. We, well, we do have a, a, a few. We do have about twenty or thirty of them up. The standard ones: who's going to score first? Who's going to score last? Will there be a two-point conversion? Will there be a safety? All that stuff. Those are the typical ones we always put up. Uh, the one that I think is, I, I really love when the Patriots play is: will there be a score in the last two minutes of the first half? And you have to lay lay a price. So you're going to lay like two forty. Uh, but but I, I like the. Patriots or the Eagles to, to score any kind of score uh, within two minutes of the first half. Anybody to score within the first two minutes of the first half? No, no, the last two minutes of the last of the first, of the first half. half. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, I'm watching it more and more. It's gotten so important now for coaches. I've never seen it so so relevant the last couple of years. It doesn't matter what they've done for the first, you know, the the, the rest of the time in the first half. When you get to the two minutes, it's like. The, both teams are fighting to score last, to go into the locker room with a little momentum, especially if they're getting the ball in the second half and just get that, that momentum of scoring before the half and then getting the ball and scoring uh, first in the third quarter. And that and it's become a, a big momentum driver, and, the, and all the coaches are trying to do that. Give me two other props you've posted that I can maybe have an opinion on because I like your idea, so I don't want to, you know, I don't want to <laughs> think back. Uh, well, there's uh, – do you like the? Will there be a two-point conversion? Will there be a defensive score? Um, do you have an opinion on those? Will there be a safety? Will there be overtime? Uh, uh, I am going to go. <laughs> I'm going to go no overtime because it's happened once in 52 years, and it happened last year. And so I think uh, the cat is out of the bag on that one. We're not going to get another one. I think that um, ooh. There's always like a, will there be a field goal from more than 37 yards, right? Yeah, I think we have uh, we have the longest field goal of the game over under 47 and a half. Uh, and then, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, will there be a field goal over 37 and a half? I don't think we have. That. Oh, no, it's like it's longest field goal over under 47. Yeah. I'm yeah, going or, under. The longest going, field goal will be under 47 under, and a half yards. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. I like that. Any any reasoning? You you just feel that if they're that far out, they're going to go for it on and and try to get closer on fourth down. My reasoning is contrarian completely. Is that I think that more often than not, fans will bet the over because they're thinking about long dramatic field goals that end halves and end games. And I think that happens less than people think. And forty seven yards is a really long field goal. And these teams tend to drive the ball deep into the red zone. And yeah. so I think the opportunity for long field goals is going to be small. I like it. Nice. All right, Scooch, listen, everybody, send in your props contest ideas. Props contest at actionnetwork.com. We will choose the winner on Monday. Scooch, we will record next Wednesday for our pre Super Bowl bash podcast. Um, and we're going to talk about this game even more. We're going to come in yeah. with our Scooch that picks. I think a lot of things are going to change between now and then. Yep, they might. Here we go, buddy. Next week. All right. Talk to you. Thank you. Bye.